Big story out of the NBA. Tom Thibodeau no longer the coach of the Chicago Bulls, a move I think a lot of people saw coming. Plus, we've uh, got our teams for the NBA Finals, and so we bring in Grant Hughes, NBA featured columnist from Bleacher Report, joining us now on the Menard Studio Hotline to talk about all these storylines coming out of the NBA. Grant, thanks for the time. Uh, What's your take on this Tom Thibodeau situation up in Chicago? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit some of it. It's it was bound to happen. I don't think anybody was surprised. Um, if anything, it looked for a minute there like maybe uh, the Bulls weren't going to fire him almost out of spite, so he, he would miss out on some of the job openings. But, you know, I get it. Um, I think the risk there was real between him and management. I just I think, you know, being out here near Golden State, you saw last year that Mark Jackson had a bunch of success, and he didn't get along with anybody, so he lost the job. It's just kind of the way it goes. you got to get along with your bosses. And I think – you know, some of the ways that the NBA is getting smarter and improving in terms of resting guys and in terms of more advanced offense, Thibodeau just wasn't really on board with, with either of those. So, you know, it's tough to, to lose a guy that, that won some like 60, 65% of his games there. But, you know, management's got some decent reasons, so, so I kind of get it. What do they do with this two years remaining on the deal and the $9 million that they owe him? Are they going to figure out a way to where they don't have to pay all of that? What's, do you know what the contract stipulation is there? I don't, I don't know specifically. As it stands now, they're going to have to pay him. They're on the hook because um, they fired him. He didn't resign. Uh, he wasn't. He's not going anywhere right now as part of a you know a trade, which was which was bandied around a little bit. I do think if he gets another job this summer, um, maybe they'll work something out uh, in terms of decreasing that compensation. But but as it is now, that they owe him that money. Where does he go from here? Do you expect him to be on the uh, on the hunt for a job for long? Uh, I think he'll probably, even before he was fired, he was sort of in the mix for the Pelicans' job, um, and I think I think you'll hear his name uh, in there a little bit more. Um, but I but I also think they've got eyes out on Jeff Van Gundy and Alvin Gentry, both of whom I think might in some ways be better options than than Tibbs. So uh, I think I would look for him to be involved there. Um, but I think him sitting out a year is a real possibility. Well, you know, one of the things of, about Thibodeau, he was a great coach, obviously. Uh, you know, as the second best winning percentage in Chicago behind Phil Jackson, he was pretty good too, from what I remember. <laughs> but uh, the the big down thing on Tibbs is maybe overplaying players, uh, too many minutes with guys, things like that. They get worn down. His playoff record was not the greatest. Run out of gas was a word a lot of people used in the playoffs. Uh, is 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 he a successful coach? Pretty much anywhere he lands, or does he need that? right team to to work with the way he coaches? I, I mean, I would bet on him being successful wherever he ended up. I mean, we've just got, we've got a pretty, a pretty long track record um, in Chicago of him winning. Um, and he won a lot with, with injured guys. And, and it's probably, there's probably a lot of evidence that says guys got hurt because he worked them too hard and they wore down. Um, but the fact is that he won games with, with whoever was available, really. His, you know, he always relied on that next man up. Uh, phrase, and he threw that out all the time. And so I do think he'd win uh, just about anywhere. I, I don't know uh, if maybe there's sort of a ceiling on how good a Thibodeau team can be because he coaches the way he does. I think maybe you, we would just expect to see teams wear down, and we should expect to see um, the offense be a little clunky. I mean, that's just what he is. So, so he's successful, but I, I would question if he can be championship-level successful. Grant Hughes, our guest on the Menard Studio Hotline. It's Ford and O'Brien, ESPN Evansville 105.3, and online ESPNEvansville.com. Grant, a featured columnist, NBA featured columnist for Bleacher Report. You can find him on Twitter at GT underscore Hughes. So where does this leave Chicago? I know Fred Hoiberg's name from Iowa State's been thrown around a lot. Is it his job to lose? You know, if I had to guess, that's what I'd say. Um, Because, you know, normally it's weird. This is a situation where normally you'd say, if you're firing a guy like Thibodeau, it means you know who the next man in line is going to be, right? Because this is a big move, and, and you don't usually make a move like this without uh, uh, you know, your next steps planned out. But I think maybe just because the situation got so bad, the Bulls just decided, you know, management said, we just got to get this guy out of here regardless of who replaces him. But Hoiberg has been rumored for you know, a couple of years. Uh, and it just seems like the fit is so good there that that's the best bet. But you know, the Bulls' job is a good job. I think we should expect to see a lot of big names suddenly uh, popping up and having interest. What do you make of a, a statement I heard earlier today, uh, and the the person who said it escapes me right now? But 
the talk of, of this being Kobe Bryant's last year, we'll get away from the, the Bulls thing for a little bit here in the Tom Thibodeau story, and we'll get to the finals uh, here in just a minute. But um, Kobe Bryant says, according to Mitch Kupchak, that this is going to be his final season as a Laker. Does that ring to you that this will be it for him as the Lakers, with the Lakers, and that he'll play for another team next season, or is he done for good? I think it's much more likely that he's done for good. I mean, we've we've reached a point with Kobe where, you know, he, he's got this incredibly powerful role in the organization. I think a lot of the reason that the Lakers are in such rough shape uh, in terms of their roster and, and things like that is because he's there. And they've just invested so much in him, and I think he appreciates that. I think he likes the idea of, of his legacy being only as a Laker. Um, you know, I, I guess you can never rule anything out because Michael Jordan was a wizard. Uh, but but I'd be really surprised if Kobe uh, played more than one more year, and I'd be even more surprised if he did it for another team. Well, Jared Dudley, the the Bucks forward, uh, has mentioned that most guys don't want to play with Kobe. Well, was the word he used, and we've heard that in rumors that they missed out on some big free agents because they didn't want to come in and and, and be a part of. It's not. Kobe's team. It's Kobe, period. And, you know, he does shoot the ball a lot. Uh, there are some things that uh, maybe he doesn't back off of a little bit. What are your thoughts on the truth to that? Do you do you think L.A.'s missing out on, on some big free agents because of Kobe being there? Well, I mean, I think Jared Dudley's in a position to know, don't you? I mean, he's, yeah. he's in the league. He's still, he's you know, players talk, and it's not just, the, it's not a situation now where it's the media or or whatever else talking about Kobe being tough to play with, it's a player. I mean, it's a player that doesn't have any incentive to, to make that up. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I believe, and I think Dudley's probably right. I mean, if you watch the Lakers the last year, I mean, to the extent Kobe's been healthy, that hasn't looked like a whole lot of fun, watching a guy shoot in the 30s, you know, 30%, and taking a ton of shots and kind of dominating the ball and then not defending and, and being a tough personality. I mean, it's, it doesn't look fun to me, and, and when Dudley says something like that, it kind of lines up with what I'm seeing. So, so yeah, I buy that. Is uh, we're down to just two teams now, so the off season is near. Uh, is is Kevin Love a free agent this year, or does does he does he stay in Cleveland where he could possibly win some championships? And if if Love is a free agent, does he end up a Laker? Yeah, Love can opt out of his of the last year of his deal, and and a lot of connected people are saying that that's going to happen um and not only that is, is that going to happen but that he's gone and i think you can read some of the tea leaves he hasn't looked happy in cleveland uh he hasn't really fit they've kind of minimized his role and uh you know he hasn't looked content there and the lakers are a real possibility that some of the same sources that are talking about him wanting out say that the lakers are a great place to land and i think the idea of being you know the centerpiece of the next era of lakers basketball should appeal to anybody um, especially a guy that went to UCLA and, and, and was born in, in Southern California and has some L.A. ties. So so I think that's a realistic possibility. Um, and, you know, he'd, he'd probably have to put up with Kobe for a year, but after that it would be his team. Grant Hughes, our guest, Porton O'Brien, ESPN Evansville, 105.3 online, ESPNEvansville.com. Grant, NBA featured columnist for Bleacher Report. Let's get into... Before we get to Golden State and Cleveland and some, some early thoughts on that, since we've got you know seven full days to discuss that finals <laughs> matchup before the series actually gets underway, between, I'll just throw this to you, between Atlanta and Houston, who do you feel has the better chance to make it back to this stage of the playoffs next season? That's a great question. I think I'd go with Atlanta um, only because if you look at Houston this year, I mean, they were the second seed, um, and the West, the West was tough. I mean, ridiculously tough. But but if you look at deeper at the numbers, Houston, you know, their margin of victory wasn't that great. Um, in the playoffs, they got outscored overall, and that was even coming into the Warriors series. So so they they it's, saying they were lucky. The Rockets is a little bit of an overstatement, but it's the I don't think it's right to assume they'll be back, especially if next year the Clippers get a little healthier, the Thunder are going to get healthier, the Spurs are going to be back together. It's just the West is brutal. And if you look at the East, you got the Cavs. I'm not sure what's going to happen with the Bulls. And then the Hawks, you know, they, they have the ability to bring back all their guys. And, and if they don't have, you know, injuries to guys like Savo Cephalosha and Millsap was hurt and Horford was hurt, maybe they're, they're back again. So I'd pick the Hawks. 
do they need, they being the Hawks, a lot of talk about them over the course of not just the regular season but in these playoffs is that they have four or four all-star players, but they don't have that one superstar guy that they can lean on to take over a game if need be. Do they need that guy in order to get over that hump and make it to an NBA Finals next season? I mean, I think it's clear now that that would certainly help because what hurt them is that, you know, in addition to actually being physically hurt, the Hawks were banged up, what hurt them was, you know, Cleveland was really good about taking away penetration, and then the Hawks didn't have a way to generate offense because they need kickouts and they need to move the ball. And if you can't get into the middle with a real shot creator, you can't do that. So, so yeah, for sure, they, they would love to get a guy like that. I don't think that's realistic. And I think the takeaway from this year is that it is possible to be really, really good like the Hawks were without a superstar. But, but I mean, everybody wants a superstar. What the Hawks are doing now is kind of, you know, a fallback plan because they missed on Dwight Howard a couple of years ago and they missed on Chris Paul. Uh, but, yeah, they, they, they could benefit hugely from a big name. Grant Hughes from Bleacher Report joining us on the Menard Studio Hotline, Ford and O'Brien, ESPN, Evansville, 105.3. Let's get into uh, just, just some early discussion on how this NBA Finals this year is going to play out uh, between the Warriors and the Cavs now that we know it's those two uh, that are going to be in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I feel like this has got... This, this should be one a very good series. I think there's a lot of storylines here that make it intriguing. I think between the fact that you've got two rookie head coaches in Steve Kerr and David Blatt, you've got two, uh, two teams and two cities that haven't had a championship, more so for Cleveland because they haven't had any major sport give them a championship since 64. At least the Bay Area's had your, your Raiders and your, your 49ers and the, and the San Francisco Giants over the years. Uh, kind of fill that role uh, while the the Warriors haven't been to the NBA Finals or won it since 1975. But just some early thoughts. How do you like? How do you see this Finals playing out once it gets started next Thursday? I think the most interesting thing to me is that I really don't feel like we know how good the Cavs are, even though they've advanced through you know the entire Eastern Conference in the playoffs and and were very good down the stretch uh, during the regular season once they got this current roster together. And I just say that because. You know, the Hawks didn't look very good, and they were they were hurt. And the Bulls didn't look very good. And certainly the Celtics weren't a challenge. The Celtics are, are nowhere near a playoff team in the West. Um, and, and you just – my sense of the Cavaliers is that, you know, they credit them for getting where they got, credit them for being in the finals, but they really haven't played anybody. And, and, tr- and certainly the Warriors um, winning 67 games in one of the best Western conferences we've ever seen, um, having relatively little trouble – getting through a tough West bracket, I feel like we know how good they are. And, and the answer to that is really, like, historically good. Um, one of the better teams we've ever seen. And that's just not true of the Cavs. So, so now it's really up to the Cavs to prove that, you know, they're on the Warriors' level. Because, frankly, um, we don't have any evidence that they are based on what we've seen to this point. If Tristan Thompson, I suspect, will, will – uh, not Tristan Thompson, I'm sorry, Clay Thompson, I suspect that he'll be ready to go for game one. But – how bad would they? How bad would they be off without him if he can't go oh, for game one in a week? It'd be a big deal because the, the sort of the quiet secret about the Warriors is that they have a ton of great shooting, and the truth really is that they have Curry and Thompson, and Harrison Barnes can knock down a three. But other than that, there's not a lot of shooting on the team. So you take Thompson out of that equation, and Golden State's offense loses a lot of the spacing that it thrives on, and it loses one of their better perimeter defenders, obviously. So Thompson's a big deal. I mean, he's kind of second fiddle, but um, he's, he's hugely important to them on both ends. The upper office, I guess, would, would be the word or whatever, the GM and, and the folks upstairs in Cleveland, do they get as much credit as it seems they should get, or am I just kind of giving them too much credit for the trades they made with a J.R. Smith, a Shumpert, and Mozgov to come in? It just seemed like that turned this Cleveland team completely around. Oh, no question. They're a completely different team than they were. I think the stat is when they made the move to get um, Shumpert and Smith, they, the, the Cavs were 19 and 16, and then they lost four games in a row right away. So that dropped them to 19 and 20. Uh, and then and then once those guys kind of came together, um, they took off. So those are risky trades, too. I mean, J.R. Smith was someone the Knicks just flat out didn't want. Um, and, and the Cavs have turned him into somebody who's, you know, a, a huge asset to them. Um, so, so bold moves for sure by the front office. But I think, you know, like anything else with the Cavs, you tie this back to LeBron. Having LeBron there sort of puts everything in order. 
and it makes it so those other guys just can become specialists, and they're never asked to do too much because LeBron does everything. Um, so, so good moves to get those guys, um, but really the difference is just having a player like LeBron there to sort of have everything fall in line. All right, Grant, so I know it's early, I know it's a week away, but how do you like that series to go? How many games and who do you got? It's hard for me to see it going more than six. I think the Warriors win it. Um, I just think the Warriors' track record is just so much more, you know, they've been vetted. They, they've been the best team all year, and they've, they've beaten some good teams to get here. So, you know, I could see the Warriors. I don't think a sweep is realistic, and, and because LeBron is on the Cavs, if Cleveland won, I wouldn't be stunned just because he's that good. Um, but five or six games, I think the Warriors take care of business. It's Grant Hughes, NBA featured columnist for Bleacher Report. Find him on Twitter at GT underscore Hughes. Appreciate the time, Grant. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, guys. Anytime.